The American poet Robert Frost originally wrote his poem, The Road Not Taken, to poke fun at a friend with whom he took frequent walks and who could never decide which way to go. In time, however, Frost came to realize that his playful poem was a source of inspiration for readers of all ages as they sought new paths on the journey of life. I am sure that you have heard and perhaps memorized that poem. But for a moment, listen again and listen together. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, and perhaps having the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay. In leaves, no step had trotted black. Oh, I marked the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. If Robert Frost had had a navigation system in his car, <laughs> he would have known where the other road led, but he did not. So he had to choose, and his choice made him into the person that he was at the time he wrote his poem. Similar to the man in the poem, we, the lay faithful, religious deacons and priests of the Diocese of Youngstown, stand at a crossroads. We gather this morning to celebrate the Eucharist of the Lord, to bless the oil of the sick, which will be used to soothe the ill and the injured, the oil of the catechumens, which will distinguish those who will walk toward the light of Christ, and the sacred chrism, which symbolizes and welcomes us into a deeper communion with the Lord through the sacraments. These fragrant oils are tangible signs of the ministry of the church in the world, that ministry to love, to forgive, and to work for justice. Ah, but we would be childishly naive, we would be ostracized, ostracized with our head in the sand if we did not admit that that ministry has suffered in recent years. Factors such as the rise of secularism and materialism, fractionalism in the interpretation of the Second Vatican Council, the decline in the number of priests, religious women and men, and the heinous and traumatic experience of uncover uncovering sexual abuse among some members of the clergy and our lay church workers has diminished the ministry of the church. Although our goal is to strengthen the church and better utilize the limited resources we have by bringing parishes together, still, aware that we cannot do all the things that we have done in the past, we must face our limitations. Moreover, as a Catholic sociologist recently wrote, we are surrounded by a culture that is mostly ambivalent, sometimes even hostile. In our supposedly enlightened age, it seems that anti-Catholicism is actually on the rise. Where we see the results of this ambivalence to faith most clearly is in the number of people who attend Mass in our parishes and participate in the sacraments. Across our country and in the Diocese of Youngstown, merely 30 to 35 percent of those who identify themselves as Catholic actively participate in our parishes and schools. In fact, the problem has reached such proportions 
that former Catholics are now the second largest single religious group in the United States, comprising approximately 21 million people. It is not only the young that we are failing to reach. We lose enormous numbers of singles, young married couples, and middle-aged people who simply drift away. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood. We stand at a crossroads. Two paths lay before us. We can stand still, turn inward, ignore the numbers, and put all of our energy and resources into maintaining what we have, or we can turn outward personally renew our faith, invite others in, and build a promising future. In other words, we can choose to slowly shrink, or we can choose to become a dynamic, evangelizing diocese and grow. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Today, I call upon you to join me in building a local church that is committed to and shaped by a desire to evangelize, for that will make all the difference for our future. To make evangelization the top priority for our diocese, our parishes, our schools, and our religious education programs requires of us, first, to begin with ourselves. Return to a moment for a moment to the words of the gospel. There we see Luke presenting the entirety of Jesus' ministry as one of mission. That mission is derived from his being appointed by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim a year of favor from our God. That same spirit anoints you and me through the sacrament of baptism. That same spirit sustains us in the Eucharist that we share at this altar. That same spirit sends us forth to carry on Jesus' mission by witnessing to the Lord. That is the essence of evangelization. There are three essential steps that we need to take to become an evangelizing people and an evangelizing diocese. First, we must become more aware of how much God loves us. Pope Paul VI once wrote, Modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. To witness means to bear personal testimony. And in this case, to bear personal testimony to what God has done in our lives. In the African-American Catholic community, many gatherings begin with the phrase, God is good to which the people reply, all the time. And then the leader says back to them, all the time. And the people say, God is good. It is a simple but effective method of reminding those who have gathered that they have been personally blessed. Whatever method we employ, the first step to becoming an evangelizing people is to recall God's love for us every day. That takes time for reflection, but it is time well spent. Once we know how blessed we are, we will be filled with gratitude, and then the Spirit can lead us to tell others about our good God, and through us, invite them into his fellowship. Second, we must begin to think of our parishes as a community of disciples who have been sent on a mission. In other words, we must be focused on outreach. A disciple is a person who is in a personal relationship with Christ. He or she knows Christ, listens to Christ, and imitates Christ. 
Just as the Father sent Jesus on a mission to humanity, Jesus sends his disciples, you and me, on a mission to inactive Catholics and our unchurched brothers and sisters. We are sent to carry Christ to them, firstly, by the example of how we live as Christians in the world, and secondly, by our words of prayer and praise, so that they will know the joy and lasting peace that comes from being one with the Lord. Thirdly, we must strive to make our parishes even more than they are now, centers of welcome. Father Robert Rivers, who has written extensively on evangelization, makes an important point about welcoming. Welcoming, he writes, cannot be equated with simply becoming more friendly. Welcoming is about becoming more inclusive, more accepting of people, no matter their color, their race, their ethnic origin, their language, or their social status. Those are tall orders. How are we going to do them? Or perhaps better said, who is going to do them? Our parishes are busy places. Our priests are often overworked. Who is going to do the work of evangelization? On a diocesan level, I intend to establish an office of evangelization to work with parishes and provide them with models of best practices. On the parish level, however, we need to tap into not the few who do everything, but the vast majority of people who want to use their gifts but have never been asked. If we can find ways to engage those people, perhaps some of you, we can create a legion of evangelizers to carry the saving message of Christ into the world and create parishioners with a high level of satisfaction because they will know that they are making a difference. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's good for someone else, but I could never do that. I could never be an evangelizer. I am too much of a sinner. Well, my brothers and sisters, all of us are sinners. All of us at times fail in being faithful to the Christian heritage given to us in baptism. But you see, the call to evangelize is not about us. It is all about God. And as St. Paul reminds us, God takes what is weak and makes it strong. Just look at some of the great people from the Bible and how God took them and made them strong. Isaac was a daydreamer. Leah was unattractive. Moses had a stutter. Gideon was afraid of everything. Naomi was a widow. Abraham thought he was too old. Jeremiah thought he was too young. Isaiah believed himself to be unworthy. Martha was a perpetual worrier. Zacchaeus was too small. Peter lacked courage. Timothy had an ulcer. And Lazarus, well, he had the best excuse at all of all of them. He was dead. <laughs> and yet God called each one of them, and each one of them could have been convicted in a court of law of witnessing to God's everlasting love. So what is our excuse for not evangelizing? Whatever it is, God can transform it from a liability to an asset. All we need to do is trust in him to lead us. Today, not next week, not next year, today, put aside doubt and fear. Push away hesitation and anxiety. God has given us many gifts, and he is sending us to use our gifts on a mission, a mission of life. In what we do and in what we say, Reach out, welcome others, and inflame the world with the spirit of Christ.